Coming up on DTNS, Meta wants to reach out and touch VR. Amazon and Visa are on the rocks. And Apple wants to fix its record on right to repair. This is Daily Tech News for Wednesday, November 17th, 2021. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Before the show, we were talking about all the ways that rotary phones were fun back in the day. <laughs> Who had the oldest TV and a whole lot more. If you want to know more about what we talk about in the pre-show and post-show, which is called Good Day Internet, do so by becoming a patron, patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Also, big thanks to our top patrons. Today, they include Ali Sanjabi, Andrew Bradley, and Dale McKahey. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Mozilla announced a paid version of its Firefox relay service, offering one subdomain address that can be used to create an unlimited number of email aliases. Users can also reply to emails directly from an alias. This is in comparison to the free version, which provides five email aliases, which will all forward to a primary account. The service costs 99 cents a month, although this is listed as a limited promotion. Security researcher Tommy Misk discovered that emails sent through the Apple Watch Mail app don't use Apple's mail privacy protection. This feature on mobile or a Mac routes all remote, co remote content downloaded by mail through proxy servers to mask IP addresses. However, on the watch, the watch's real IP address is being used. Fujifilm announced the Instax Mini Evo, a digital camera with an integrated Instax Mini printer. They our Fujifilm, they still make film. It offers retro styling, includes a film advanced like lever that will actually print out the current photo that you've taken with double the resolution on the instant photo printer compared to previous Instac printer models. It launches in Japan on December 3rd, coming to the US in February for $199.95. Instagram confirmed that it's asking suspected bot units to verify that they're actually human and not bots by submitting video selfies requiring multiple angles of a user's face. Instagram said this doesn't use facial recognition and that the selfies are reviewed by internal teams. And Microsoft began testing a new media player app for Windows 11. It's rolling out now to Windows insiders in the dev channel. This supports both audio and video and will replace the Groove Music app, the legacy Windows media player app, as opposed not to be confused with the new media player app for Windows 11, will still be available in Windows tools. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the future of VR and AR, potentially. Meta's Reality Labs showed off a haptic glove prototype designed for VR and AR interaction, which the company says has been in development for the past seven years, been working on it for a while. The glove is lined with 15 ridged and inflatable plastic actuator pads, which create pressure on your hand as you interact in a virtual world. Reality Lab sees the glove as one of the multiple controller methods for future mixed reality experiences. And according to Reality Lab's engineer, Catherine Healy, the glove needs high density actuators to let users feel texture, also to have a spelter design when you're wearing it, and to be fully wireless before it can be considered ready for consumers. Meta is diving into the field of soft robotics, which motors can in some places be replaced by air valves. When Meta, and this was Facebook at that point, acquired Oculus VR back in 2014, it developed its first prototype, one finger with a single actuator, in 2015. You might remember that. It does seem that behind the scenes, there's been some big progress being made here. Yeah, this is really exciting for me because as cool as like head tracking and, you know, kind of kind of inside out tracking, the advancement we've seen in VR on like the headset front, th this kind of like interaction stuff, you know, having like the hand tracking controllers, that's cool. But like the the whole, uh, uh, you know, believability of a virtual experience is still like, OK, I'm manipulating these controllers. And the ability to add touch to me is that like next big frontier when it comes to like immersive experiences and stuff like that. And. What's interesting is, you know, going into the in, into some of the history of this, they said that model with that one actuator, I think the demo was like someone picked up a plate or something in virtual reality. And they said even just that added a, a, like a giant level of immersion. 
they're now at 15 uh, uh, you know, of these actuator pads, so they're able to get, obviously, much more fine uh, pressure response to it. But really, yeah, once, once you get into that area of texture, I could see that having a lot of applications just for, like, room sensing, where you could, like, as your hand approaches, like, the wall of a room, you could be like, oh, I can actually feel that there's a resistance there now. Or, like, it, from a yeah. productivity standpoint, I could also see it, like, you could even do, like, some kind of virtual keyboard stuff where it's like, oh, I can actually feel I'm pressing down on something. Maybe that's not even there. There's a whole huge range, obviously, with gaming, a whole huge range of possibilities. But some interesting stuff, although it does definitely look Nintendo Power Glove-ish uh, in its current iteration. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as somebody who's, I'm I'm a Quest enthusiast, obviously a, a meta product, formerly Facebook, and there there are times where it, there's only a few apps that I, I use with regularity, and most of them are exercise apps, and there are times where I, I'm kind of like, this controller works, I gotta hold something, it's the only way they can track my hands, but mm -hmm. it could be less sort of... Uh, clunky. Uh, you know, there's all these buttons I'm not pressing, and you know, I'm just trying to, you know, smash balls in the air type thing. And I, go ahead, Roger. Oh, no. I What I was going to say, it's like it dawned on me, one of the, the things that make it so interesting, what's so fascinating, is that this will eventually be a mass market product, right? In the same way that uh, game controllers are now just seen as a mass uh, uh, market product. Back in the early days, they were very exclusive and they were very limited to a particular set of industries in the same way that we have haptic feedback technologies now, but they're very expensive and they're limited to flight simulators, they're limited to medical instrumentation. But if you can mass market these, then you ought not only open up uh, people's access to these, but you open up the ability for developers who might not have the huge resources of a government-funded agency or a large corporation to develop really interesting and nuanced products that you normally couldn't because there was this cost availability barrier. Yeah, that's a really good point. I uh, I I look forward to, and we talked about this a little bit in our pre-show meeting about how you know I was kind of taking this to okay, how does this make games more fun? And it will, right, if the technology works well, but more for accessibility stuff. I think that that is that 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 is that makes a lot more sense in the case of okay, somebody needs to be able to simulate real life on some level, you know, not, it's not the same thing, but to be able to do that, uh, in a situation where that becomes more lifelike than ever, rather than you're not looking at photos, you're not watching videos, you're there. And I think that that, that's where this becomes really not just interesting and cool, but really helpful. And I mean, yeah. just, Oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say the next step beyond this, though, has to come into like like more uh, overt resistance, which I think is, again, that, that's another thing where soft robotics could become a major stepping stone uh, for this. But like I, I always refer to it with like the VR gaming, like the lightsaber test, like that's it seems like that's everyone's first tech demo when they do when they were doing VR was like, give you a lightsaber. Look, you can swing it around. It's super cool <laughs> without any kind of resistance to that. It always seems to fall apart after the the initial excitement of that. That to me is like uh, from at least from a gaming perspective certainly from a immersive vr perspective would be the next like kind of like major breakthrough but the fact that this is they're even showing this off shows that you know they they have obviously have some plans for this i mean they renamed themselves meta so obviously have big plans <laughs> for vr and ar uh but uh yeah it, it's uh looks like it's a few years off from being a consumer product but maybe on the horizon I mean, Rich, think about if you're really allergic to cats, but you've always wanted to go to a cat cafe. We're getting mm -hmm. closer. This is true. I mean, it's it's And a that's just one use case that I've been thinking about today. I was like, well, how will this benefit people? It's, you know, there are so many use cases that it would. All right. Well, one thing I definitely have a use case for is repairing some devices. And Apple announced something right up that alley. They announced a self repair or a self service repair program, and that lets customers buy parts from Apple directly. Apple will publish repair manuals online and charge the same price for tools and parts that they charge authorized technicians. Customers can then download uh, software for parts that require calibration or programming. This would be relevant for like that screen replacement, uh, that small uh, microcontroller that they had there that need to be authenticated to the cloud. This would presumably extend to that. Completed repairs also won't affect a device's warranty if 
I'm assuming you follow all of their steps. Parts of iPhone 12 or parts for iPhone 12 and iPhone 13 models will be available first in the US in early 2022, followed by M1 Max. This is a big win for proponents of the right to repair program. However, there are those that do feel that this maybe could put some repair shops out of work. Sarah, I mean, is that uh, within this overall, will enough people take advantage of that, that that will become a long-term issue, do you think? Oh boy. I, so I'm not a person who wants to open up my phone and repair it. It's because I don't trust myself, not because I don't think that should be available to me. I think this is a really big win. I would have gone to a mall and perhaps found some repair kiosk. There are others, but you know, you, you know, that, you know, the types of repair shops that I have, and, you know, when you're talking about Apple, it was it was always, you know, official certified uh, third party repair shops that could fix something here or there that I had broken. And this has happened for a few of my Apple devices over the last decade or so. I don't want to do this necessarily the way that I don't want to change my own oil because I'm like, eh, <laughs> I don't I just don't want to do it. But you pay the premium for someone else to do it. And for people and I know in the audience are like, I want to tinker. I've built, you know, however many PCs. I know what I'm doing. This is a, I think this is a really good thing. Yeah, and especially for uh, either people that, uh, uh, you know, like especially when I was younger, I mean, I would, you know, building PCs and stuff like that. And where I was uh, definitely more uh, price conscious when it came to repairs and stuff like that, a huge boon for that kind of stuff. The the other, the, the I guess with this announcement, I was just trying to like figure out, okay, what's the what's the catch here? Like I'm, I'm looking for- Yeah, like what's the Apple's fine print or something game. Like that. Yeah, I mean, the thing, I think the oil change is a perfect example where it's like imagining a world where there was, you know, cars were proprietary closed systems and you couldn't change your own oil and then suddenly they did it. Probably it would not be that much different. Like the, the market share wouldn't be that much different. We would still have, you know, authorized repair, loop stop technicians or whatever, you know, you want to call that. I think that's a really great uh, comparison to that. Whereas there are some people that are going to take advantage of this that are really going to love it. And the vast majority of people probably don't have, don't want to invest the time uh, and and take the risk certainly of damaging uh, further a device, but um, I, you know, is this Apple maybe trying to get ahead of uh, or seeing where regulation is going and saying, hey, we might as well get some goodwill out of this while we can? I mean, that's I certainly, so. yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm reading into this. If Apple had the capacity to do this in the past and said, no, 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 you're gonna ruin your device, trust us, it's better this way, and then all of a sudden says. Reverse course. Here's some manuals. You know, it's it's opt in. You you could still have somebody else do this for you, but now you have the option to do it. I don't think Apple loses anything here, but people saying, "Okay, Apple, listen to us. We now have more options," and that's true. I just don't think the company is gaining much except goodwill, and in the current landscape, that's probably a good thing. The warranty thing for me is the is was the biggest surprise where it's like, OK, you can do this, but, you're, you know, you're kind of on your own. No, I mean, they're they're saying, you know, if you follow the steps, uh, the warranty will be extended. And uh, there's also a component to it where you can send in your old stuff to be recycled and they'll give you a credit, I guess, on the new parts based on uh, what you send in to be recycled, which, again, is like again, kind of uh, getting that consumer goodwill. I think this is a big deal, actually, when they're, they're going to be coming out with this for the Macs, because I know there was a big concern. Obviously, Macs have been kind of a closed, even when they were x86-based, kind of a closed system. But, you know, there was there was some, I don't know, they, they used some kind of industry standard parts that weren't completely uh, uh, mounted to the board and stuff like that. I, I feel like that kind of for anyone that was maybe on the fence when it came to, okay, I don't know, you know, I have to take this to Apple. There's no other place I can work on it. That does give a little bit of, I guess, reassurance. I mean, you still have to go to Apple for all the parts, right? They're all proprietary Apple parts for the most part. But uh, yeah, it, an interesting move by Apple certainly doesn't, uh, especially with all of the concern that people had over that whole screen replacement thing that we were seeing over the past couple of weeks and saying like, oh, Apple had to, you know, bend to public pressure with some of the, <laughs> some of the reactions to that. Uh, not if this was already it clearly was already in the pipeline uh, for them going forward. So it's a I, interesting. I, stuff. I'd also like to see, and I'm not saying maybe it'll be seamless and I can eat my words, but I'd like to see how making sure that you did it properly would not void a warranty. If indeed you yeah. have to go back to Apple for something like that, so then I did it right, and the company goes, mm, "Did you though? You left out that screw. Mm, sorry, no, yeah. <laughs> no warranty. For yeah, you. <laughs> no money for you." 
Well, if you have thoughts on this and anything else we talk about on the show, you can always join the conversation in our Discord. That's what you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Story that made a, uh, quite the rounds this morning. Amazon announced that it will stop accepting Visa credit cards issued in the UK, UK specifically, because of what Amazon says is too high of fees, starting on January 19th. An Amazon spokesperson said that the high interchange fees on credit card transactions mean higher prices for shoppers when, as Amazon says in a quote, these costs should be going down over time with technological advancements, end quote. In response, Visa said that it was disappointed that Amazon was threatening to restrict consumer choice, but was working on a solution. Now, to be clear, this does not affect Visa debit cards attached to Amazon accounts, although the number of Visa debit users said that they received Amazon's warning in an email as well, which caused some confusion, obviously. When an Amazon user pays with a credit card, not a debit card, but a credit card, Amazon pays a fee to the bank that issued it. That could be Visa, MasterCard, American Express, just to name a few. Amazon isn't the only large merchant complaining about the fees that have ended up suing Visa and MasterCard and large card issuing banks. As a result, you might remember a few years ago, supermarket chain Kroger temporarily stopped accepting Visa cards at some of its stores, kind of over the same thing. Amazon is offering some customers affected by this UK move, uh, 20 pounds or about 27 US dollars, off of a purchase to encourage those customers to update their payment method or, you know, it, into another type of credit card or a Visa debit card. Also, and this was something that confused me a little bit this morning, even though I don't live in the UK, Amazon and JP Morgan Chase offer their own Visa credit card in the US. I am a member of this program with Amazon Prime members getting cash back on purchases for using the card with some other uh, kickbacks as well. So Rich, uh, when I, I I was I was trying to say, okay, what's Amazon doing here? What's Visa doing here? Who will fold first? To me, the fact that probably, a, not everybody, but a fair amount of users could say, well, this is annoying, but okay, maybe I can, you know, switch my payment option uh, to another card that uh, isn't my Visa credit card. Maybe it's a debit card. Maybe it's another card. That's fine. For those who can't, ex extremely prohibitive. And I feel like Amazon wants this to be as public as possible so that Visa says, okay, okay, you have other options. We know you do. Let's, let's play ball. Yeah. I, I think it, I mean, certainly Amazon as a ginormous retailer has an incredible amount of leverage uh, when it comes to this. And it's, it's interesting though, because people complaining about, or, or, you know, I, I don't even want to say complaining about, uh, uh, changing business practices because of higher credit card transaction fees is nothing new with smaller retailers, usually like at a gas station, there's some gas stations that say, Hey, if you pay with a credit card, it's this amount, you know, this amount per gallon. If you pay with cash, it's this amount. Uh, see it at stores where they'll, they'll give you, they'll only give you maybe a discount if you pay with cash or something like that. So that is, is, I don't think is too controversial to say like, Hey, these fees can be onerous even at the scale of Amazon. It's, it's this kind of, Hey, we're just going to cut it all off. The, yeah. That's my question is why not just just say, okay, we're gonna. I, I guess they don't want to see even like the bad guy there if if they're forcing people with a Visa credit card to pay more. Uh, as a result, it's an interesting tactic. It really reminds me of an old like a carriage dispute between like YouTube TV and uh, NBC or something like that, where there's two t there's there's two giant companies that have giant piles of money and they're arguing about over how to to switch between the two. Um, as as a consumer. Sure. Yeah. The, the interest is just figure it out. Don't disrupt what I am doing. The well, fact that they're giving credits and stuff like that to me signals that this isn't maybe just uh, it, well, it is maybe going to be a longer term uh, issue, though. Well, what's interesting is you what you brought up is the consumer sent sentiment. And Amazon has tremendous, tremendous leverage. I mean, a while back in the U.S., Costco ex accepted exclusively American Express cards, which is, if you know the the consumer landscape, American Express is, is one of the uh, smaller held cards compared to Visa and MasterCard. Um, and they held up for a very long time against uh, allowing or accepting Visa until they could come to some sort of agreement in terms of, of, of fees. And I think Amazon has has a has maybe a two track mind of this. One, they want to look at you know they want lower fees from Visa, but 
if they make it uncomfortable for for consumers, they can say, well, hold on, if you have a visa, and you know don't want to pay higher prices, they could. Amazon has enough has enough you know dollars behind it or, or pounds sterling behind it to offer their <laughs> own sort of payment option where you get a Amazon card because you know. How many things do people buy off Amazon? I would hazard to guess at least 50% of the goods people buy typically come from Amazon, whether it's small stuff like soap or big things like a big screen TV. It's kind of one of the shopping uh, avenues that people have besides going to a store. That was what confused me the most this morning. You know, Again, don't live in the UK, so I realized that this, this conversation didn't apply to me today. But I thought, well, hold on a second. I have an Amazon card. It's a Visa card. Amazon uh, marketed it to me. Chase is is you know doing the whole back end of it. And yeah, I I get points for buying things on uh, uh, you know Amazon or Whole Foods or you know there, there's a few different cashback scenarios and it does come in handy. That <laughs> that would be extremely confusing if the two companies couldn't come to some agreement if that sort of thing became unavailable to me in the future. Not saying that that's what this story is about, but I think that this is a, it's a little bit of mudslinging in order to get Visa to back down. That would be my guess, is that Amazon saying, well, I mean, everyone's just going to switch to another card if you don't, if you don't yeah. lower your fees. A Amazon arguing it's, yeah, it's easier to, to switch payment methods than it is to switch uh, giant global retailers, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, where else are you going to get those blankets? Yeah, I don't know. What I buy pay a lot for of shipping. Come on. on, come on. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right, and our final story of the day: uh, the rise of social media entrepreneurs is nothing new. Not breaking any news here, but uh, there are you know personalities and brands on different social platforms reaching well into the hundreds of millions uh, of followers at the very top of those uh, of those platforms. Interestingly, however. Having a large following on one platform often doesn't translate to another. Axios looked into this phenomenon, looking at the top 50 most followed accounts across Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Some curiosities kind of came out, some kind of fun tidbits here, like the fictional British character Mr. Bean is the fourth most popular page on Facebook. I Okay, sure, why not? Uh, but has fewer than 250,000 Twitter followers, so I guess... Uh, uh, the charm of Mr. Bean yeah, is tough Twitter's not for the place for Mr. Bean. <laughs> yeah. But re what really stood out, though, is that TikTok kind of stands alone in that none of the top five accounts on TikTok ranked in anywhere in the top 50 on other social media platforms, and that the combined followers of all other platforms, not even being half of the collective 480 million of those top five account on TikTok. So really just kind of creating their own stars and kind of living within that ecosystem. So Axios kind of looked what breaks out each platform or what 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 do the top accounts kind of have in common across the different platforms. Uh, unsurprisingly, TikTok favors creators that have built out a presence on that app rather than things like large entertainment organizations. On the opposite side of that top, YouTube accounts are dominated by bigger entertainment accounts, and fifty. And it's in, it's also international, which is really interesting. Fifty-five percent of the top twenty most followed are coming from India, South Korea, and Russia. Facebook preferences brands with uh, preferences brands thanks to more of its like style of following. So even if they don't create a lot of content, you just kind of oh, I like Coca-Cola, so there you go. Uh, top Instagram accounts are celebrity driven and have the largest total numbers uh, of any of the platforms. I think the top uh, accounts have like you know, 200, 300, 400 million. Uh, Twitter also prefers celebrity driven accounts, although just at a, a smaller scale, given that it just doesn't have as big of audience. Although it's the only one with politicians and business leaders in the top 20. So Sarah, what kind of stood out for you in this report, uh, kind of looking over the findings? Well, so I, I recently started working on a show and, uh, I don't know, I'll tell you all about it some other time, but, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a couple of creators who have a big TikTok following, but it's very short form, uh, comedy driven, you know, sh sh uh, quick cuts type of TikTok humor and uh, doing really well and decided to launch a podcast recently. And we're trying to drive folks to their YouTube channel, which had a lot of room to grow. And it has been very enlightening to try to figure out, well, okay, if you have some sort of a longer form podcast, which is the, this is, it doesn't seem to be resonating with the TikTok people all that much because you kind of have to do what you were doing before, but that's where your audience is. But why are you trying to tell them to go somewhere else? And if a YouTube audience doesn't know you from TikTok, 
there is no real crossover there. Sometimes there is, you know, if you're Christian Ronaldo, you know, <laughs> you know, hats off to you, good sir. But I think that this is something that content creators and I would count myself as one of those people saying, okay, where do we decide to build our audience? And if it's not all in one place, what makes sense for, uh, you know, to, to spread the content across multiple platforms? Because that's time consuming, sometimes, you know, money consuming as well. And sometimes doesn't really give you the, the results that you're looking for, but everybody's different. But it seems like from the Axios report that you were laying out, uh, Rich, that this is, I'm not alone here, that there is just, there's no formula that necessarily works. Yeah, and it it kind of reminds me of that uh, uh, you know that famous uh, Marshall McLuhan observation: the medium is the message. And I was thinking about like TikTok, like literally TikTok content up until a couple of years ago wouldn't even if, if it was possible to create like really short, uh, musically driven uh, uh, kind of content. At least you know uh, for a lot of TikTok content, like it would have gotten taken down from by Content ID if you posted it on YouTube, and short form content wouldn't get prioritized by YouTube's algorithm and portrait orientation. Like so, like. Just the whole idea of uh, of like audiences, like on a very technical level, like the channels that allow TikTok content to flourish, are like aren't possible on other platforms. And there's a lot of other things like that, like uh, you know, a lot of Twitter content is uh, obviously is very text based, uh, text heavy. A lot of uh, a lot of link sharing on there. Uh, if you're that kind of account and you prosper on that, uh, turns out. Instagram for a long time up until they've had links and stories is like a really terrible like way to kind of transfer that audience. So if like, if that's what you're looking for on a Twitter follow, Instagram might not be the best one. And then, you know, like all of these obviously have their own kind of charms or attractions or addictions, depending on what you want to call them. And uh, it's, it's tough to translate that through. And really, uh, one of my, my favorite bits from the Axios report was that there were only three, uh, accounts that had, uh, that appear on the top 10 on more than one platform. You mentioned Cristiano Ronaldo. We have Ariana Grande and Will Smith. Well, and you know, all pretty well known, uh, folks in the entertainment slash sport world. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I think the takeaway from anyone listening to this saying, well, okay, I, you know, I'm a burgeoning content, content creator. What do I do? Is there's a lot more about figuring out, okay, well, who else is doing well on these platforms and why? And what what bucket do I fit into in order to to leverage that if if you so desire to do so? And if you can, be Will Smith. That would be my recommendation. Or that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, before we get out of here, we have something coming in from Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler. If you're traveling to your next destination on an airline, you might find the whole process a bit faster. Can't wait to hear from it. Take it away, Chris. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. As a software geek who loves travel, I was really interested to see that the FAA has begun rolling out new software that will help manage the flow of airplanes in and out of airports. The idea is that with this software, you don't need to spend as much time on the runway. That saves passenger time on the plane and it also saves fuel. So much so that a trial at the Charlotte airport, it saved around 275 thousands of gallons of fuel per year due to a reduction in taxi times. That's about the same amount of fuel as 185 flights between New York and Chicago. It also reduces greenhouse emissions, so score one for software. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Uh, yeah, that's nothing to sniff at. That's a lot of fuel. You're saving some fuel. Yeah, uh, that's good stuff. Uh, thank you, Chris Christensen. As always, also, we had a great mailbag. This one comes in from Sam in Belgium, who wrote, just a reminder... Uh, well, this is just a reminder of all the things that we talk about on GTI. Uh, we were talking to Dan Compost yesterday, who was explaining how quesadillas in Mexico City, where Dan lives, don't always include queso or cheese. And you might say, but what's a quesadilla without cheese? Sam says, I found it hilarious when you were st started the discussion about quesadillas sin queso in Mexico City. My wife is from there. I've often heard her discuss the topic with her Mexican friends here in Europe who are from other parts of Mexico. So they do things differently there. So, of course, I had to mention to her that you talked about it on the podcast, and she immediately started talking again with the arguments of why quesadillas can be without cheese. And this is what you're missing if you don't listen to GDI every day, everybody. You learn something <laughs> new. You do. Yeah, 
You can send those in to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, GDI or DTNS related. Uh, we love to see them either way. And one thing we want to do before we get out of here, give a special thanks to Peter Carrero, who is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Peter, thank you for all the years of support. Truly appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. Thanks to all our patrons. Y'all are the best. We do the show every weekday. We are live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we will be back tomorrow. Tom's joining us again. You know, he does the show most days. With Justin Robert Young joining us as well. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>